Good morning. It's great to see all of you here today. We have more people in the church building, so people are getting over this virus. It's great to see you all here. Now, the last two weeks I've been preaching on repentance, the saving grace of repentance from Luke 13 and Luke 18. And in that preaching, I mentioned that faith and repentance are together. They're not separated, so it just seemed to make sense now for me to preach on saving faith today. So take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I'll read verses 1 through 10. This is the words of the living God. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the other, or as the other mankind. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When you consider the teaching of God's word on how someone is accepted by God as righteous, there are many passages one can go to. God is not poor in demonstrating his great love in the gospel of grace by faith in his son, And even if you begin at the book of Genesis and go all the way through the book of Malachi, you'll see that Abraham and all believers in the Old Covenant believed God, believed in the coming of the Messiah, and when they believed, God counted that as righteousness, even in the Old Covenant. Our Lord Jesus' teachings, along with the apostles, their disciples, and all ministers throughout the ages agree that the truth of men being right with God. When I say men, I'm talking men, women, boys, and girls, that they are accepted by God based upon faith in Jesus Christ. That is a foundation of the Christian faith. Without that, you have no Christian faith whatsoever. And that has been the stance of Christianity throughout the ages. The one who believes savingly upon Jesus Christ is declared righteous. That was the cry of the Protestant Reformation Faith alone in Christ alone, to God alone be the glory, as opposed to the whore of Babylon's false gospel, that someone could be right by their good works. The Roman Catholic institution, or really any religion that preaches a salvation by good works. Now, God's word is clear that Christianity is radical. There's a complete change in the person standing before God in light of what they were in the past. There's also this radical change in the person's nature, in their soul, at conversion, when they are regenerated. God's great power takes the impossible and makes it a reality. Jesus Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit, with the word of God being preached, takes dead sinners and makes them alive to God. Dead sinners being regenerated by the very power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this salvation is in spite of the fact that that every human that comes into this world is in a grave, serious, deadly Condition, depraved heart, which even includes these Ephesian Christians. And in these verses here, we're going to see this wonderful 
change? Dead, someone being made alive, how does that happen? And I would submit to you, it is by saving faith. Now, our passage before us demonstrates three things. If you're taking notes, there's three things that we'll be looking at today. The first thing is that there was much that God had to overcome. That's the first thing. Second thing is, he did it. He overcame it. And the third thing is, what happened? How did this happen that someone that was dead has been made alive? I would submit to you it is saving faith. Okay, the first thing we'll look at is that God had to overcome a lot. Now, that may sound strange to your ears. God had to overcome a lot. Just stay with me. Hang in there. That's in these first three verses. And these first three verses in your English translation is one run-on sentence with lots of commas. So, my job is to bring out some of those difficulties that God had to overcome. Now, just remember that these Ephesians are in a deadly state. And you, now my Bible translation says he made alive. Many of your Bible translations does not have that in there. Do not let that distract you, okay? The translators seem to think it was fine to do that. The guys I was reading in my library were split on it. But the bottom line is eventually he says it again. So let's not allow this to distract us from the truth that God did indeed make these Ephesians Alive, He took them and made them alive, but he had to overcome quite a bit of wickedness, which is what we're going to look at here in these first three verses. Let's view these obstacles, if you will, that God had to overcome. First of all, they were dead in sin. They were not alive to God, nor could they resuscitate themselves. They had no chance of doing that. Now, that doesn't mean because of the fact that they're dead, that they were inactive. They were inactive with regards to any movement towards God. But they're very active in rebelling against their very creator that had made them. In fact, the Jews of the Old Testament would call men that were wicked and ignorant, quote, dead men, for there is no death like those that transgress the words of the law, end quote. Hence, you see in the Old Testament the command, turn and live. Sin is what makes men dead. Now, I want you to notice here that Paul reminds these brethren of their past. That they were dead in trespasses and in sins. They had broken all of the Ten Commandments. In Ephesus, it was commonly known as a sexually immoral area. Rampant with that. And ramp it with idolatry. So the preaching that came to them with the word of God coming to these Ephesians was that this is an offense to God. Your sexual immorality, your many gods, even your very nature should indicate to you that the very God who has made you isn't made of wood and stone. That wood and stone can't do a thing for you at all. But their rebellion being dead in trespasses and sins, being active in their sin, sprang from a sinful nature. By nature, they were sons of disobedience. And also, you add on to the fact that they were dead in trespasses and sins, they had a sinful nature, they were active in sin, Satan was working in them. And what was the end result of Satan working in them? Ungodly lusts, passions that produced more sin. You see the vicious cycle, corrupt nature. Continuing on in their lusts and their passions. Satan working in them. Being, them being contrary to God, against God. And remember this, they were called children of wrath. God is angry with the wicked every day. They were in a very sad, sinful condition in these first three verses. I want you to notice how the apostle includes himself in that. When you look, take a look at verse 3. Among whom also we once conducted ourselves. Now I want you to notice that the apostle is dealing in the past tense. That's encouraging. I also want you to notice that the apostle is dealing with them generally. There is no need... For the apostle to start laying out a laundry list of all their sordid sins in the past. 
That's not Paul's intent. He says, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You were being led by the devil. You had your sinful nature. You, we, then he includes himself, we walked according to our lust and our passions. So it would appear that this is an awful lot for even God to overcome. Satan working in these Ephesians. Them continuing to be sons of disobedience as others. So you didn't have a very encouraging example around you because you had the rest of mankind around and that was also doing the same thing. There was no godliness going on there. Remember, go back to Ephesus 2,100 years ago. There was no gospel there at all. There was just this flood of wickedness until the gospel came to them. But do keep that in mind. There is a great measure of depravity. Wherever God and his gospel is not there, there is no restraint. And so that was what was going on in, in Ephesus. There's no restraint with regards to sin. Children of wrath. And Paul even includes himself in that. Now there's a term in here I want to address rather quickly. Uh, I don't think you were distracted, but it, but it helps. It's called the prince of the power of the air. I think you see that in your Bible translation. should be in verse 2, prince of the power of the air. Just to explain this a little bit for you, just to help you, is that this does not mean that air and wind is wicked because the demons are, are living there. Okay, What Paul is bringing out is that there's an evil influence that's unseen. And this evil influence is Satan and his demons. We cannot see Satan and his demons with our eyes. They are spirits. So it's an evil influence. And this is what is described by Satan. This evil influence in the sons of disobedience. That's what the prince of the power of the air means. If you disagree with that, no big deal. Let's just move on and make sure we don't miss the point of the passage here. Because their condition here was in rough shape. They had no hope whatsoever. Their destination was not looking good at all in terms of when they were to die. They had a bad nature. They had a bad life. They had bad thoughts. They had bad pursuits. They had a bad intent. They had a bad past. They had a bad present. And they had a worse future, all coming from a bad heart and would appear to be no hope whatsoever from verses 1 through 3. But then something changes in verse 4, which is our second point. And that is, but God. But God. And he did it. He overcame these obstacles from verses 4 through 7. God did it, who is rich in mercy. You can also put the term in there, loving kindness. God is rich in mercy. Loving kindness, mercy. Remember what I preached last week? The tax collector, what was his request? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful, be loving kindness to me in spite of my, if you will, verses one through three. Great in love, the apostle says. His great love with which he loved us. He uses that in the past tense. Did you notice that? He loved us in the past tense. What happened in the past tense to demonstrate the love of God? It was the Lord Jesus Christ's death on the cross. That's how God's love is manifested. His goodness is manifested to all of us. Food, shelter, clothing. We enjoy one another's company, even if we're unbelievers. But the, the definite love, the great love which God showed was manifested in his son. Now consider this wonderful work here because of the fact that these Ephesians were at one point dead in their sins and yet they were made alive. Remember, these Ephesians were not moving towards God when the gospel comes to them. They were going the opposite direction. But God himself made them alive. That's there in verse 5. He made us alive. God made us alive. Now, I have a couple of questions. It would appear to be ridiculous questions, but I think you'll understand these questions. Here's the first question. Did God see something good in them that moved God to have compassion on these Ephesians? Look at verses 1 through 3. Do you see any goodness in there at all? 
No. It wasn't because of some goodness God saw in them, so he decided he was going to save them. Or did God see them that they would believe, and therefore he chose them because he saw in the future, hey, if I give the gospel to them, now I'm talking like a man. God's not like a man. That's what sometimes portrayed. Did God see something that they were going to do, and therefore they were going to believe, and therefore he was going to choose them? Look at verses 1 through 3. They were on a breakneck course for hell. By their sins. They were helpless and undeserving. They were in open rebellion against God. Now, when I use the term helpless, it's not as if they were innocent. They were rebels against God and against his ways. But God showed great mercy and great love to these Ephesians. And I want you to notice this work of grace, sitting together in the heavenly places in Christ, sitting in the heavenly places in Christ. Wait a minute, these Ephesians are literally living in Ephesus. How are they sitting in the heavenly places in Christ? Well, they are united to Christ in a very wonderful way by faith in him. Now, Paul hasn't mentioned faith yet, Kind of drawn back the curtain a little bit about the answer for that. But just remember, and keep this in mind, is that they are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Though they're in this world physically, their record in heaven is righteousness. And notice here that this is a rich righteousness. If I could use an accounting term to help us understand the great debt that these Ephesians had. Imagine because of their sin, they owed God $1 trillion. That's a lot of zeros, kids, with a one in front of it. That's what they owed God. That would not appear to be, okay, not that big of a deal. But just remember, this is God who demands infinite perfection. Now, when Christ paid for those sins, and God was rich, did that just get that $1 million down to zero? Okay, now we owe God nothing? No. It goes on the other side to where the great riches is the infinite righteousness of Jesus Christ being put to Christians, to these Ephesian Christians. I want you to notice, too, that the apostle uses Jesus Christ's name three times. Now, I've talked about God having to overcome these sins. Well, it was God the Father sending the Son, the Son making payment for the sins of those people, and the Holy Spirit applying the work of Jesus Christ. It's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost doing this wonderful work of conversion in these Ephesians' lives. God, rich in mercy, great love. He loved us in the past tense by sending His Son, being long-suffering with us. We were dead in trespasses and sins. He made us alive. You can just hear the gratitude out of Paul's heart as he continues to have his penmen write to the Ephesians on this made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus record is clean in heaven we have a, un- a unity there with Jesus Christ and this is all we are our heavenly kingdom being there in the kingdom of God is sure it is steadfast it is not going to be some dream for these Ephesians exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus The Lord Jesus Christ accomplished so much with his death on the cross. It says in verse 12, 13, I should say, in the same chapter. And now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off. Remember, these were Ephesians. These were not Jews. They didn't know anything at all about God. The gospel comes and is preached to them. They repent. They change their mind. They believe upon Christ. And now they who used to be far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Being dead, they were made alive. The question is, how did they get to that point of being made alive? I mean, you look at verses 4 through 7, and it talks about how God was rich in mercy, great love, he loved us. He doesn't mention the cross there. I'm interjecting that. There's trespasses and sin, made us alive by grace, okay? 
Grace, I understand, is unmerited favor. God showed favor to us. We were not going in God's direction. We were going the opposite direction. And yet God had mercy on us. So he's talking in general terms. And now he gets specific. If you move to our third point, which is saving faith. How did these Ephesians obtain this salvation? How did they obtain this standing for God to where they were actually righteous in God's sight. How did they obtain that? How is it a certainty that they were on their way to heaven and they could not lose that salvation? Well, this faith, first of all, before I describe it, is according to grace. Notice, for by grace you have been saved through faith or through that vehicle commonly known as faith. Faith which was according to grace and not because of something that they deserve, not because of their works. If it was a Jew sitting in their audience, they could not say it's because you kept all of the Ten Commandments, is it? You've broken the Ten Commandments. No, it's a gift from God. Just as I preached for those last two weeks that repentance is a gift from God, faith is a gift from God as well. And these two graces, repentance and faith, are inseparable. And look at this. The reason that it's a gift of God is so that no one would boast. Wait a minute. We do boast. We boast in the grace of God. But Paul is bringing out that we do not boast in ourselves. Look at the past, Ephesians. You can't boast about the fact that you had some goodness within you. You had this spark of faith within you. And all you need to do is somehow, some way, work it up and generate it. And now you have saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It excludes boasting. But what it does bring out is that there's full enjoyment, full joy, forgiveness of sins, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me ask three quick questions here, which I think, since we're in the area of grace, should help us understand faith a little bit more. Eventually, I'm going to explain what faith is. But did faith make them alive? Well, no. It said that God made them alive. Not faith that made them alive. God made them alive. The next question is, when does generation occur? Does it occur before faith or after faith? You have to say before faith. He made them alive. Notice that he made them alive in verses 4 through 7. By grace you have been saved through faith. That faith isn't even something that you had originally. It was a gift from God that God graced to you. To believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Does faith come about before regeneration? I've heard many say, yeah, faith does the regenerating. And that's wrong. That's giving all praise to man. Let's keep that in mind now as we continue to look at faith. The grace of faith. Because when you look at verses 8 and 9, I'm not even going to address 10 yet. 10 is a sermon in and of itself. When you take a look at eight, it's by grace through faith. Now, here's something that's important to understand. Let's say, and, and well, okay, let me just say this. If I were just to preach verse eight, and I didn't read verses one through seven, some of you, I would hope, have the grace to come up to me and say, you know, Rick, I think you missed the boat on this one. I would say, why is that? And you would say, well, there's a, there's a word right there that says for by grace, for by grace. And I would say, yeah, so what? You say, well, usually when the four is there, you've got to ask the question, why is the four there for? Why? It's a continuing thought. It's like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? Okay, we got that. But the word is for God so loved the world, which means what's the context of John 3, 16? You can look at that later. But there's a context to John 3, 16. It happens to be the book of Numbers. It happens to be something else from what people sometimes preach. So when we take a look at verse 8, you have to at least explain in some detail verses 1 through 3, the bad estate of the Ephesians, and 4 through 7, God overcame it. Now we're able to say, oh, okay, how did they get to this particular point? Because or for, by grace, you have been saved. What we've been talking about in the past, for the last half hour, 
In the past, it's by grace, faith. You've been saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. Okay. Let's camp here for a little bit longer. Nice day. Campfire's going. Food's ready to come out. No need for us to leave right here. The question that has to be asked is how does one inherit eternal life? How does one get to this particular point? And obviously the text says saving faith. Now there are many strange views that have crept into the church to where saving religion is nothing more than a mere mental agreement with certain truths. Some truths come out, Jesus is Lord, Jesus died for sinners, Jesus was raised from the dead. The one sitting in the pew, listening, gives a nod of agreement, and they think that is saving faith. With no conviction of sin, no change of life, some have even preached that God has done everything that he can do. Now it's up to you. Because God would never impose his power on your free will, would he? He's a gentleman, isn't he? I've heard it said God has cast his vote. Satan has cast his vote. You cast the final vote. And in my notes, I've got next to it rubbish. That's what that is, rubbish. If it wasn't so serious, it would be funny. But men actually preach that stuff. Nowhere does God portray this type of exchange, voting. It's nothing more than a device of man. Even some false teachers have characterized saving faith as a sort of a jellyfish float into the kingdom of heaven. A lazy, sleepy transport into the kingdom. But look at what I just read in verses 1 through 7. Something happened dramatically to these people. They were made alive. What they used to do, they no longer do. Saved unto good works. Saving faith isn't inactive. It's not just some mere mental agreement to certain truths. The Lord Jesus taught that the kingdom of heaven is taken by force. Strive to enter the narrow gate. If you have a problem with that, you have to take that up with the Savior. I'm just repeating it. Take up the cross daily. That's self-denial. Count the cost. Now, whenever a question is posed to the apostles after our Lord's death and resurrection... And that question comes to them, what must I do in order to be saved? They never said, well, there's nothing you can do. The Philippian jailer falls before Paul's feet and he cries out to him, sirs, what must I do in order to be saved? Paul does not say, well, there's nothing you can do. Nor does he lead him in some type of a sinner's prayer mantra But what does he do? He commands him to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. When a soul is made alive, when a soul is regenerated, every effort is made within that soul to repent and believe. There's compelling reasoning by the minister to his congregation to believe this gospel, not this inactive, lazy, do whatever you want, walk the aisle, sign a card, presto change, you're sticking in the microwave, you are now a Christian without any conviction of sin, specific sin. When Peter preached to those men in Acts chapter 2, he got specific with them. They had broken the sixth commandment. They had murdered the Lord Jesus Christ. He got specific with them. And what did they say? Sirs, what must we do? And Peter didn't say, there's nothing you can do. Repent, is what he said. Be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins. The faithful preaching of the word convicts sinners. They are dead in trespasses and sins. They are convinced by that. 
And as a result, they believe. And that same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is at work in the Christian. It's not a lazy and active, mere mental agreement with certain truths. That's not saving faith. What is saving faith, you may say? Saving faith is a saving grace. Whereby a sinner receives and rests upon Jesus Christ alone for the saving of his soul as he's offered in the gospel, as he's offered in the word of God. He is saved from hell, from sin, from his nature, from the penalty of the law. And this is all resting upon the Lord Jesus Christ. If any of you know anything at all about the Westminster Confession, I just basically stated it. If, anything, if any of you have uh, read our Confession of Faith, and that should sound familiar. For those of you that came into membership of the church, that's one of the questions we ask when you come into the membership of the church. Do you receive and rest upon the Lord Jesus Christ alone for the salvation of your souls? To many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord. I used to be in rebellion against him. I believe him. I believe that he died for my sins. I will now obey him. Faith and obedience are tied together. They're married together. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Obey him. Receive him as Savior by virtue of his death. We practice this every week when we have the Lord's Supper. It reminds us of what was paid for our sins that we might increase in faith. Now, in order to believe something, understanding must be involved. There must be some measure of understanding. There must be an understanding of personal sin. I mean, why would you believe if you were not that bad off? There must be a belief in that personal sin. God's anger and unrighteousness. For our God is a consuming fire. There must be some degree of faith that Christ came and lived and died and was raised from the dead. He made payment for sin. So that the benefits of the preaching comes to the hearing sinner and therefore they receive and rest upon Christ alone. If you will, it's almost as if we are staking our eternal soul, not with your eyes closed, with your eyes open and you fall into the arms of our Lord and Savior. You are believing upon Christ to save your never dying soul. Where else can we go? Where else can we go who can offer such a great salvation as our Lord and Savior? When convinced, the believer believes God. And the great thing about the believer when he believes the Lord Jesus Christ believes upon him for the saving of his soul with his death and resurrection, at that moment, God declares you righteous. That's justification. I've just mentioned two doctrines, saving faith, justification. Justification is something God does. He declares us righteous when we believe upon Christ. Even calls me righteous in spite of the fact that I know I'm going to blow it here in the future. And look at my past. I mean, all these people in church, they look great, but give me a break. I don't have that good of a past at all. He declares you righteous at that point. Declared righteous. Not because of something you're going to do, but now we have peace with God. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Obviously, there's got to be understanding. There's got to be reasoning from the word of God for it to make sense to the saint, to the sinner. To the saint and to the sinner. There must be some reason. God never bypasses the mind. Goes through the mind. Hits the soul. And it puts it into our feet. To where we believe. And we are now doers of the word. Now. I have to deal with false faith. I've already touched on it a little bit. But let me hit you with three false faiths if you will. It's in our confession of faith as well. And I've already mentioned it the first time. That just a mere agreement. 
with certain biblical truths is not saving faith. You have to have those truths. You must believe those truths. But some, sometimes, they have this, okay, I agree. I was raised in a church. Jesus is Lord. Uh, he died for sinners. He was raised from the dead. And that's all they do. It's just a mere mental agreement. That's not true faith. That's a false faith if you do not continue on. Do not move on to belief. There's another faith that's faith in faith. You've heard of that. Faith in faith. You see this all the time. The athlete scores a touchdown or whatever. What made you do it? Or how did you? Oh, I, I have faith. Okay, so faith is just believing that something good's going to happen. You know, I have faith in myself or faith in this. Or it's just the object of faith is faith. It's not in the Lord Jesus Christ. The object of faith, where we put our rest in, our trust in, is critical. It has to be in the work of Jesus Christ. There must be some conviction of sin. There's got to be. Or you see no need for a savior. I'm not that bad of a guy. Yes, you are. You need a savior who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the, there's another false faith. And that's a false faith that falls away. That does not endure unto the end. We see this with the sower and the seed. The cares of this life. Deceitfulness of riches. All these things flood in. They choke the word out. And that one becomes unfruitful. And they are no longer walking in faith. So, how does one get to that point of believing upon Christ? I'm going to bring up a really bad example that will hopefully teach us something. Imagine a preacher who preaches out of the dictates of his heart. And occasionally he sprinkles in a verse here or a verse there, maybe a John 3.16 or Romans 10, which I'm going to... Uh, mentioned here in a moment and then after he gives his general preaching or teaching he now commands those out there in his audience to accept the lord and the ones sitting in the pew may think well why should i accept the lord and the minister continues on to say well so you could be saved from hell and the ones sitting in the pew may say well why should i go to hell I'm not that bad of a guy. I mean, sure, we're all sinners, aren't we? So if we're all sinners, what's the big... Okay, I guess there's a hell. I'll do whatever you tell me, minister. So the minister does not preach the law at all. He doesn't get particular. There's no conviction of sin. The sinner is not lost. He's not that bad of a guy, I guess. All I need is just a little faith to get me over the hump. Okay, now the minister told me I can't put my trust myself. Okay, that's fine. I can do that. No problem. I can do that. Um, can't put my trust in my good works. Okay. Um, all I have to do is accept the Lord. And so what you have to do is walk an aisle, and the minister will pray a little prayer for you, and then he tells you that you are a Christian. He might even quote Romans 10 to you. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, I walk the aisle, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, I agree that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the, and the, and the uh, one that's hearing this begins to reason and says, okay, I, you know, I've got the star of David. I can do this belief thing. I can do the best I can. I'll just add this a little agreement to truth to my list of things to do. And therefore, I guess I'll be okay. Besides, the minister told me I was okay. It's biblical. He quoted Romans 10. I believe this stuff. I agree with this stuff. I'll accept the Lord. And so the sinner does his little activity with no conviction of sin. He moves on to continue on in his sin. And when he's questioned by a true Christian, if he's living with his girlfriend, or if someone's getting loaded, or someone's getting drunk, or someone never attends church. And the man says, well, of course I'm, I'm, a, I'm Christian. I did something 15 years ago. I did this. That's justification by his good work that he did 15 years ago. But there's been no change in his life, you have to ask, does he really believe the gospel when Jesus says, repent, present tense, or you shall perish? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Many, the reason I'm bringing this up 
If you've been around a long time as a Christian, I've been around for 42 years as a Christian, and I cannot believe the amount of people that I have talked to that are, I'm shocked by their language, by their profanity. I'm shocked by their immorality. They have no shame at all for their immorality or, or, or they, this continual drunkenness or the profanity that comes out of their mouth. It just, and, and you ask them about it and they go back to 15, 20 years ago and some minister told them something because they walked an aisle and signed a card and they think they're fine with God. You can ask them a million times over, do you trust in Jesus? They will say yes. But if you ask them, are you wicked? Are you enduring unto the end? What would they say? It's sad. It is sad. My dear wife and I, we have, we have neighbors in our neighborhood that have bought into that. And because of the fact that some minister has given them great confidence in that they did 15 years ago, even though they're not walking with the Lord at all. And they're not in church. The profanity spews out the drunkenness. I, how does that work? Right here is what happens is when a minister doesn't do his job and he tries to please the people. That's sad. Ministers are going to have to give an account to God on that great day. If that minister has that finger pointed at him and says, you led these people astray. You led them away from me. Saving faith endures unto the end. Saving faith is to believe, to rest upon something that is true. It is to believe the word of God. God said he made all things in the space of six days. He was there. I wasn't. I'm going to believe God. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He is the son of man and the son of God. God manifested in the flesh. The thief on the cross even acknowledged that. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This day you will be with me in paradise. We believe upon his death, his resurrection from the dead. How he willingly went to the cross. And died for us cr criminals. After suffering the wrath of God, he was raised from the dead. That's why we're here on the first day of the week to remember his resurrection. And when we believe upon that, we are justified by God. No need to try to carry any more burdens. No need to look for a savior. No need to look for some other way to be forgiven. A dear friend of mine, this goes back about 40 years, everything's 40 years ago with me, 40 years ago, good friend of mine, he and I were Roman Catholics, it appears that we're both converted, and uh, he gets married, married in a Christian church, he goes to church every Sunday, this is great, and then one day he calls me up after about six months, and he says, Rick, I'm going back to Rome. I said, why would you do that? He says, I need to have the priest tell me my sins are forgiven me. He needed to hear a man tell him his sins were forgiven him. It's a big deal in Roman Catholic institution. You don't get absolution unless you go through a priest. He did not have trust in Christ. He wanted to hear something with his ears. My dear brethren, have you seen the Lord Jesus? Don't you dare say yes. <laughs> we see him by faith. Have you heard his voice? By faith, we believe that we are accepted with God Almighty through the work of his Son. Faith is commitment and obedience to Jesus Christ. Look at what happened to these Ephesians. You were dead. Not anymore. You once walked according to Satan. Not anymore. You once conducted yourselves in your lusts and your passions and your desires. Not anymore. More. Does that mean I'm perfect? No. My dear brother, we're going to fall. We will sin, but we return. We believe upon the Lord, but there's got to be that faith and commitment. That's how God works, faith and commitment. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in flaming fire, he takes vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey his gospel. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 17, but but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, he's talking to Romans that are Christians. You used to be slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart 
that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. There's that obedience to the gospel. Faith and obedience are tied together. Faith and repentance are always there. Unto good works. Let's talk about verse 10 just for a moment because I did mention it. That's a completely different sermon, a new sermon in my estimation. But here's something for us to be encouraged about. We are his workmanship. God is working in us. Wait a minute. I'm a mess. All I see is sin, even the very good things I try to do, I don't do. The very evil I don't want to do, I end up doing. God is at work in his people, created in Christ Jesus. We are new creatures. We have a new nature. We have desire for the Lord. Whatever the Lord would have me to do, I want to do it. I sense I'll fail, but please, Lord, I believe upon you. I've staked my never-dying soul upon what you have done, which God prepared beforehand. What did he prepare beforehand? Our good works our good works, that we should walk in them. Here we have God's sovereignty and our duty. God's sovereignty and our duty. But we're new creatures in Christ. God working in us. God's plan. Our responsibility. Now, I'm certain that I've, as I preach this, I hope so, that those of us that are weak in faith may say, Where? I, I need to fill up the cup. The cup is way low on faith. I am weak. I am decreasing at times with regards to my faith. Or you may be strong, and you're increasing in your faith. Thank the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. But you know, in spite of our faith being assaulted, in spite of it being weakened, faith gets the victory. Why? Who's the author and perfecter of our faith? Our Savior. That is where our encouragement comes. That is where our strength comes from. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the object of our faith. He is the hope of our faith. He is indeed our everything. That doesn't reduce our responsibility, but we take great comfort in knowing that the Lord is at work in us, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. My dear brethren, look at how these Ephesians were saved. Look at how you were saved. Don't forget your past. That doesn't mean you live in your past, but it doesn't hurt for you every now and then to go back and think about, you know, I used to be dead. I used to walk according to my passions and my lusts. I used to. Because then it will make you appreciate God's grace in your life, make you appreciate the present grace that you have, and the future that we have with our Savior who is seated in the heavenly places. Our Father, we we pray to a God that we do not see. We trust in your Son, who we've never seen. We trust in your Spirit to make us alive, whom we've never seen. But yet we believe upon your word by your grace. And we give you thanks and praise you, O Father, that you've given us another day for the good of our souls. We thank you, our Father, that you have appointed the Lord Jesus Christ to be the Savior of his people. And, O Father, we renew our peace with you once again by faith in your Son who has loved us and given himself for us. And our desire, Father, as we leave this place, that we would have increases of faith and hope and charity in you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, to walk by faith and not by sight. And, O Father, we believe upon you, and you are the rewarder of the one who comes to you that believes that you are and that you are the rewarder of the ones who have faith in you, who walk after you. Thank you, our Father, for your kindness to us. Thank you for another day of life. Thank you for sparing our souls. Thank you for the gospel of your Son. Hear our prayers, accept our thanks, our gratitude. Thank you for the joy and comfort of our souls, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name that we pray. Amen.